Good evening, everyone. My name is Derek Yellen, and I'm from University College London. And my co-chairman, known to you all, is Dan Drucker from Toronto. And we both would like to welcome you to our Cardiology, Diabetes and Nephrology at the Limits meeting. This uh, so-called at the Limits meeting has been running annually now for the past 23 years. However, this is our first meeting in North America. And this inaugural meeting means that Canada now joins the United Kingdom, Brazil and South Africa with hosting its own cardiology, diabetes and nephrology at the limits. Uh, over the past 23 years, we've tried to bring the very best speakers from across the globe to present their thoughts and findings in our areas of interest. Um, as we are unable to meet face to face, this will be our very first virtual meeting. And in this regard, we are delighted that this first event, we have over 500 delegates registered. We certainly hope you enjoy the program that we put together, uh, both this evening and tomorrow evening. And we also hope that this will elicit, elicit lively discussion and hopefully entertaining debates. Our fellow chairpersons of, from Canada, from the United States and South Africa and the UK will host the meeting. And we urge you to take part using the window on the right of your screen where you can send comments and questions. Now, as the Lancet is a collaborator on our At The Limits meetings program, we always try and start our meetings with a Lancet lecture, which this year has been given by Dr. Bernard Zinman, who needs absolutely no introduction, uh, but just to say he has been a major international influence in cardiovascular medicine. I'm proud to welcome Bernard to give the Lancet lecture entitled 100 Years of Insulin, Have We Reached The Limits? And following Bernard, we'll have two presentations, one from Lawrence Leiter from the University of Toronto, and this will be followed by Robert Hegeli from Robots Institute. Lawrence will cover controlling cardiovascular risk factors in 2021 beyond glucose, and Robert will discuss new genetics and therapies of dyslipidemias. And at the end of the presentations, all three speakers will join us live to discuss their findings. Uh, Dan, would you like to come in and say anything at this stage? Sure. I just want to uh, welcome everyone, uh, and thanks very much for devoting your precious time to this activity. That The highlight, uh, as Derek mentioned, is almost always the questions and answers. We usually have an intimate forum and uh, really terrific questions, and we're very fortunate to have the faculty. And that will start at 39 minutes after the hour. So I really uh, look forward to uh, seeing you engaged and uh, hope you enjoy the content and we'll see you back here in about 35 minutes or so. Thanks very much, Dan. So without any ado, it's our real pleasure to hand over to Bernard Zinman to present the Lancet Lecture. I'm Bernie Zinman. I'm a senior scientist at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute, Mount Sinai Hospital, and professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. I'm delighted to participate in this At The Limits conference in Canada, and uh, I'm particularly honored to deliver the Lancet Lecture, 100 Years of Insulin, Have We Reached The Limits? These are my disclo disclosures with respect to uh, this presentation. So the objectives of my uh, presentation is to provide a historical perspective, perspective on the discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto. I also want to highlight some advances in insulin therapy and the continued challenges. Let's set the stage for the Toronto discovery. <clears throat> in 1869, Langerhans described irregular shaped islands of cells in the pancreas. These are called the islets of Langerhans. In 1890 on, Mehring, Minkowski, Gley, Zulser, Opie continued to make important advances characterizing what was called the internal secretion of the pancreas. 1919 on, Paulesco, Kleiner have success in reducing glucosuria in, in dogs, but with inconsistent results and serious adverse reactions. 
there were no conclusive studies in people with type 1 diabetes. This is what McLeod's laboratory looked like at the University of Toronto uh, in May of 1921 when Banding and Best initiated their work. Leonard Thompson, uh, as many people know, was 14 and the first patient to receive insulin at the Toronto General Hospital. And this is Leonard Thompson's chart. And as you can see, he was admitted in December uh, of uh, 1921. Uh, first note says he's feeling well on admission, uh, drinking uh, fluid freely, uh, he weighs only 65 pounds, uh, all of a sudden he's having more ketosis and uh, not feeling much better. And on January the 11th, 1922, 15 cc's of what was called McLeod serum, because it came from his laboratory, 7.5 cc's into each buttock was administered. And this uh, chart also describes the first adverse effects of insulin uh, injections, a subcutaneous reaction with a 7.5 uh, uh, cc uh, diameter, uh, what sounds like an abscess over the buttock. Here we see Leonard Thompson's glucosuria chart, the way we measured uh, diabetes control in uh, patients uh, that are, are admitted to hospital. Uh, is to measure glucosuria. And here you see uh, that uh, the first injection uh, sh on uh, January the 11th uh, perhaps reduced glucosuria somewhat. But subsequently, uh, uh, January 22nd on, you see dramatic reductions in glucosuria from approximately 200 grams of glucose in the urine per day to less than 20. The second series of injections were a consequence of the preparation uh, prepared by Collip. This uh, obvious uh, improvement and obvious th uh, clinical response uh, can be summarized as follows. The experiments conducted at the University of Toronto and Toronto General Hospital resulted in the first demonstration of a pancreatic extract that could be prepared that would consistently lower glucose, reverse ketosis, and arrest the catabolic effects of type 1 diabetes. This resulted in the remarkable rapid commercial production of insulin in 1922 and the awarding of the Nobel Prize in 1923. And here you see Banting at work in the laboratory around 1923. And one of the patients that uh, came to Toronto uh, from uh, the United States was uh, a young lad, Ted Ryder. And here we see him uh, before and after insulin. And this is 1922. Ted's uh, mother wrote to Banting and Banting agreed to treat him. And you can see this uh, sort of emaciated young boy transformed to a chubby, healthy uh, uh, little guy in the picture on the right. Well, Ted Ryder did very well. And here you see him at age 75 when he came up to Canada uh, uh, in the context of celebrating uh, the uh, 75th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. He was uh, the first person to be on insulin for 70 years and he died at age 77. This is what a vial of insulin looked like back then produced by the Connaught Laboratories at the University of Toronto, and the entire vial contains 50 units. Concentration of insulin was 10 units per cc, that's 5 cc's. Of course, now we have 100 units per cc. Here you see uh, what the Nobel uh, Prize Award looks like. Uh, as you can see, it's awarded to uh, Fred Banting and uh, John McLeod. Uh, and uh, that created a great deal of controversy, as you can imagine. Uh, but they're only allowed three names on uh, a Nobel Prize. They decided to settle with Banting and McLeod. Banting shared his prize uh, money with uh, Best, and McLeod shared his prize money with uh, Collip. So let's hear more than just a single case. What was the uh, benefit of insulin uh, therapy? And uh, of course, uh, having been discovered in Toronto, the first 50 uh, patients were actually treated in Toronto. 
Uh, and this is a, a remarkable description, which I'd like to share with you. Up to the present time, over 50 cases of diabetes have been treated with insulin. Many of the patients have come to the hospital in, a, in the state of extreme undernutrition, suffering from great weakness, along with a indisposition to any physical activity. On the first or second day of treatment, if sufficient insulin is given, the urine becomes sugar-free, as you saw, and on the second or third day, ketone-free. These patients become conscious of increasing strength before the end of the first week. Hunger is replaced by appetite and the thirst is lessened. Edema, which is common in these cases, disappears. Patients find they are less irritable and state that they begin to sleep well. The expression improved, the skin becomes less harsh and dry, even the hair becomes softer. In fact, the patient loses that appearance which characterizes the diabetic. In 10 days, a very considerable amount of physical vigor is restored. And amazingly, some patients have even been able to uh, return to work. Clearly a resurrection and a dramatic uh, clinical response to a new therapy. So the insulin era was wonderful. Patients who uh, had a short life expectancy now lived uh, many decades. However, it soon became clear that this insulin era is also associated with long-term complications. Visual impairment and blindness, total of 30% occurred in people on insulin uh, with type 1 diabetes. Renal failure, 35% of, of individuals. Stroke, 10%. Amputation, 12%. Myocardial infarction, 25%. And mortality was increased two to six-fold. And this is a description from the Steno Hospital, a major diabetes therapy hospital in Denmark. So people were puzzled, why did this occur? You know, people with diabetes look healthy, why, why are they getting these complications? And one of the explanations was the imperfect correction of glucose, and that it was this high blood glucose that led to the complications, namely the glucose hypothesis. I was fortunate enough to be part of the original uh, DCCT, and we continue uh, to uh, study these patients. Uh, and the uh, glucose hypothesis stated treatment that normalized glucose levels will prevent or delay the long-term complications of diabetes. We had a primary prevention cohort and a secondary intervention cohort. Primary prevention was to see if you could stop the development of, of retinopathy, secondary intervention to see if you can slow the progression. And indeed, uh, the study was stopped early and the results presented at the American Diabetes Association in uh, 1993 and published in the New England Journal at the same time. And the reason this study was uh, stopped early uh, was because of the dramatic benefits that were accruing. You can see retinopathy, either development, three-step progression, or severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy dramatically reduced. Nephropathy, microalbumin, and albumin were uh, uh, reduced. And neuropathy, uh, by clinical assessment, was also a very a significantly reduced. However, there's another issue to this diabetes control conundrum, namely hypoglycemia. On the left panel, you see the rates of severe hypoglycemia, coma, seizure, uh, requiring uh, external assistance is much higher in those on intensive therapy compared to conventional. During EDIC, everybody was on, uh, uh, was switched to uh, intensive therapy because that was clearly a change in the standard of care for patients with type 1 diabetes. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see, the rates of hypoglycemia are still unacceptably high in both the original conventional group and the original intensive group. Now, McLeod and Campbell wrote in 1925, and using insulin would of course be ideal if it could be supplied so as to imitate the natural process. And that's what we do as endocrinologists. We always like to replace hormones and duplicate physiology. This is a tough task for insulin. As you can see here, the 24-hour uh, insulin profile is actually quite uh, dramatic with large increases in insulin occurring at the time of meal ingestion. Glucose is kept pretty constant, 
but there's a basal requirement of insulin 24 seven. And then when nutrients are taken in, carbohydrate, protein, and fat, a large secretion of insulin is required uh, from the pancreas. How do we duplicate this? And uh, in uh, 1989, I was asked to write uh, a piece for the medical intelligence section of the New England Journal on the physiologic replacement of insulin, and I indicated that this remained an elusive goal. But progress has been made. Here we see the timeline of insulin development. And you can see that first we were restricted uh, by animal insulins, and this is peak uh, insulin from uh, bovine or uh, pork uh, sources. Uh, and indeed, there were uh, still uh, things that could be done to improve the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of insulin, making longer acting NPH and Lante series of insulin um, and uh, protamine zinc insulin. Uh, however, things took a leap uh, forward when semi-synthetic human insulin and recombinant DNA human insulin was produced, thus relieving any concern about insulin supply from the source and also reducing the probability of insulin antibodies and a resistance that could develop. Uh, then we go on, of course, to develop uh, designer insulins, rapid-acting insulin analogs, better basal replacements, and uh, this is a very active uh, field of uh, discovery. So let's talk about basal insulins. So basal insulins have to have certain characteristics. We need long duration. We want to control fasting blood glucose with at most one injection per day. Indeed, now there are basal insulins that can be given once a week. We want flat time action profile, low risk of hypoglycemia, nocturnal hypoglycemia. And as patients describe, we want less variability. Patients will tell you from day to day, their response to the same dose of insulin seems to be variable. And can't you fix it, doc, so that this doesn't occur? What about meal insulins? Well, for meal insulins, as you saw, we need rapid absorbed insulin. And here you see the desired meal timeline and the normal free insulin levels that occur with meals. So we want to minimize postprandial glucose excursions because that contributes to overall control. We want to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia in the postprandial period. And uh, this continues to be a challenge, but good progress is being made. So what are those continued challenges? So the Despite 100 years of progress, can the subcutaneous injection of designer insulins truly duplicate physiologic secretion? I thought it was an elusive goal then, we're getting closer to that. Will it be necessary to achieve hepatic exposure to high portal insulin concentrations that are seen with physiological pancreatic insulin secretion? Hypoglycemia risk will always be a challenge for any open loop system. An improvement in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of insulin without a closed loop technologies are probably at the limits, the title of this symposium. There are exciting opportunities. We are on the threshold of developing an affordable, widely used closed loop artificial pancreas. The development of smart insulins whose biological activity is modulated by Ambient glucose concentration would be uh, a dramatic leap forward. Injecting insulins whose biological action is modified by the prevailing glucose level. And there's continued research and development of tissue-specific insulin to enhance the hepatic activity to more closely approximate physiology. And for type 1 diabetes, we know this is an immunological disease. Can we develop immune interventions that can prevent the uh, development of type 1 diabetes in high-risk individuals. We have come a long way in 100 years. Hopefully, the optimal replacement of insulin and or the prevention of type 1 diabetes will not take another 100 years. Before closing, I want to acknowledge uh, a colleague and friend uh, who passed away in 2017, Michael Bliss. He would have been so excited to take part in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin.
he is uh, he had contributed in a major way to medical history, particularly as it relates to the discovery of insulin and the players that are associated with that discovery. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Lauren Sleeter, Professor of Medicine, University of Toronto, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today on controlling cardiovascular risk factors in 2021 beyond glucose. Here are my disclosures. As you're all aware, the majority of our patients with diabetes will die of a cardiovascular death. And the challenge is how can we reduce this risk? And guidelines around the world recommend a multifactorial approach for modifying cardiovascular risk in our patients with type 2 diabetes. There are very few studies that have actually uh, looked at multifactorial risk reduction. Our best data from the small STENO2 trial we now have 21-year follow-up from this trial, and what it showed is that patients in the intensive therapy group survived for a median of 7.9 years longer than a conventional therapy group patient. With regards to glycemic control in type 2 diabetes, the evidence is mixed. We don't have convincing evidence of cardiovascular benefit, but of course, we now have evidence with multiple antihyperglycemic agents with the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists showing cardiovascular benefit above and beyond glucose lowering and guidelines around the world, including our recent Diabetes Canada update recommend the use of SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists in appropriate high-risk patients. With regards to blood pressure, we have a number of trials looking at intensive versus less intensive blood pressure lowering. Here you see the results of a meta-analysis showing overall benefit in most but not all of the endpoints looked at. And guidelines generally recommend a target blood pressure of less than 130, or in some cases, less than 140 over 80. With regards to lipids, we have evidence from the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration, looking at the various statin trials, that the benefits of LDL reduction are similar both in those people with and without diabetes. If we need add-ons, the Improve It trial showed that the combination of azetamibe plus simvastatin showed greater risk reduction uh, in patients with diabetes versus statin alone, whereas interestingly, very little benefit was seen in people without diabetes. We also have evidence with PCSK9 inhibitors. Here you see results from Fourier, patients with diabetes on the left, those without diabetes on the right, and the addition of evolocumab to statin therapy resulted in greater relative and absolute risk reductions than the statins alone. Based on this, guidelines recommend an LDL at least less than 2.0 in our patients with diabetes. We also have evidence from the REDUCE IT trial looking at the addition of icosapent ethyl IPE uh, in patients with either uh, cardiovascular disease or diabetes plus one risk factor. Uh, and you can see here overall 25% relative risk reduction, almost a 5% absolute risk reduction over five years. And if we look at subgroups, similar benefit in people with and without diabetes. With regards to aspirin, multiple trials not showing overall benefit in patients with 
diabetes uh, without prior cardiovascular disease. As you can see in the ASCEND trial, there was a significant reduction in serious vascular events, but the cost of an increase in major bleeds and overall no net clinical benefit. We have data looking at combination therapy of ticagrelor and aspirin in the PLATO trial in patients with acute coronary syndrome shown at the top, and in the Pegasus trial in patients post-MI, the combination of aspirin plus ticagrelor showed significant reductions uh, in overall uh, in net clinical benefit, both in people with and without diabetes. More recently, we have results of the Themis trial done exclusively in patients with diabetes and stable coronary disease without prior MI or stroke. There was a significant reduction in cardiovascular events at the cost of an increase in major bleeding events. Overall, no net clinical benefit. However, in the subgroup of patients with prior PCI, there was indeed a more favorable net clinical benefit. The COMPASS trial looked at the combination of low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus aspirin alone. And here you can see, once again, people with diabetes, a greater risk, but similar relative risk reduction and somewhat greater absolute risk reduction than in people without diabetes. So how do we put this together? In our high-risk patients, we can consider residual cholesterol risk, inflammatory risk, thrombotic risk, triglyceride risk, or LP little a risk, and we have a number of targeted therapies to try to reduce these risks. And here you see a summary of these various interventions that I showed you. And each of these interventions, we have evidence can reduce the risk of MACE, of all-cause mortality, of stroke, and of myocardial infarction. So how do we compare these interventions? Well, it's difficult to ascertain comparative benefit given different patient populations with varying trial designs, endpoints, and duration of follow-up. Studies who generally evaluated these agents individually and not investigated whether combinations of these agents could provide synergistic benefits. And clinical trials commonly just add a new medication to the existing standard of care regimen. And it's possible that the new drug could obviate the need for prior agents considered standard. So in summary, we are now blessed with multiple evidence-based strategies to decrease cardiovascular events in our high-risk patients with diabetes. Appropriate choices in a given patient will depend on the degree of abnormality in the risk factor, physician comfort with the intervention, of course, cost and access, as well as patient preferences. So we do have the evidence for significant cardiovascular risk reduction. The challenge is knowledge translation to get these therapies to our high-risk patients. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Rob Hegley. I'm a professor of medicine at uh, Western University in London, Ontario. And I'm going to be talking about the new genetics of uh, dyslipidemia and uh, treatment. So these are my disclosures. And really, there's uh, two main objectives for the next few minutes. So I'm going to be talking about uh, new insights into the diagnosis and treatment of hypercholesterolemia and then insights into the diagnosis and treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. So uh, through the ages, uh, so this is then, uh, in fact, when I graduated from medical school in 1981, uh, this is the state of knowledge of familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, 
that it was a one in 500 disease that had autosomal dominant inheritance and it was primarily the LDL receptor. There's certain clinical features. You made the diagnosis based on clinical grounds and then the treatment was you know, diet, lifestyle. and Actually, statins were still years away from being introduced. So there was, um, and then you know, apheresis as well. If we flash forward to now f 40 years later, uh, our, uh, it, it really is amazing as to how, how much our knowledge has evolved. So first of all, the, the disease is more prevalent than we thought. The genetics is quite complicated, uh, much more complicated than we thought, many causative genes. Uh, there's also polygenic risk, which is an important factor. Clinical features are pretty much the same. We, we now use DNA in the diagnosis, and we have all of these treatments, many, many more treatments, so I'm going to some of the, some of which that I will mention in my talk. Same with severe hypertriglyceridemia. So back in the day, we used to think it was like this. So these are like triglycerides over 10 or over 1,000 milligrams per deciliter. We used to think this was like a super rare uh, condition, and it was like you know uh, primarily uh, uh, Mendelian, you know, autosomal recessive. And there were two genes, lipoprotein lipase, and then also from the work from St. Michael's Hospital, even in those days, you know, APOC2 was known as a causative gene and the clinical features that you, that you see there, and then the diagnosis was clinical, and then the control, there really was not a lot that could be done. It's, it's now amazing, you know, 40 years later. First of all, we realize that it's much more prevalent, at least, you know, so, uh, now the, it's the polygenic form. <laughs> Most patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia actually have polygenic hypertriglyceridemia. There are some uh, Mendelian genes, uh, clinical features are the same, but in fact, we're now starting to have, or we're on the, we're on the verge of having many more treatments for this. So um, you may have remembered from medical school the Fredrickson classification. So this has now, I think, been superseded by this, this sort of simpler classification where we look at the main lipid disturbance. Is it an LDL problem? Is it a triglyceride problem? Or is it combined? Is it like combined LDL and triglycerides? Uh, or is it an HDL problem? And then is, you know, is the uh, elevation, is it mild to moderate or is it more severe? So that's how this, uh, how this slide is broken down in, in terms of then the, the quality and the, qua the quantitative aspects of the disturbance. Uh, for the mild to moderate elevations, those are often related to secondary factors. If there is a genetic component, it's usually a polygenic component. But for the severe elevations, so the you know, familial hypercholesterolemia, LDL above 5 or triglycerides above 10, there were a, a larger proportion of those are monogenic uh, or stronger polygenic predisposition with secondary factors. And so then these can be actually, uh, in terms of the monogenic, the single gene disorders, there's actually 25 named disorders. The most famous is familial hypercholesterolemia. Then there's like familial, familial chylomicronemia syndrome on the triglyceride side. There's 25 disorders, 25 genes that can be organized this way. And they have a range of clinical features which are shown in this slide depending on whether the primary disturbance is high LDL or low LDL or high triglyceride or uh, low HDL states. Uh, these are the, the f clinical features that you read about in medical textbook. So those are the monogenic, but in fact more common is polygenic, uh, especially for triglycerides. So for polygenic, for in, in monogenic illnesses it is a single mutation in a single gene that fully explains the phenotype. For polygenic disorders, we, it's really small effect common variants that then cumulatively add up. They each incrementally raise the lipid a little bit. In this example, it's LDL. So these are common variants that we all have. You know, usually we have a balance, some raise, some lower, but some people get a preponderance where every time they're always getting the variant that slightly raises their LDL and then puts them into the range where it looks like they have a single gene mutation. So when we're diagnosing these now, we need to be aware of the two types. We need to have a methodology that will detect the monogenic and the polygenic. Um, and then this is then when, we, when we've actually then um, broken it down diagnostically. For familial hypercholesterolemia, patients referred to my clinic, about 53% will have a single gene variant, so classic FH or related gene. Another 13% will have polygenic uh, hypercholesterolemia. The other third, we're still uh, trying to figure out why their cholesterol is high. For triglycerides, it's different. 
for triglycerides, only a minority have, like literally 1.1% have the autosomal recessive Mendelian form, 14% are heterozygous, the majority are actually polygenic. So triglyceride is different. Triglyceride is not as strictly classically genetic as you think of, whereas FH is more like you know what you learn about in, in classical genetics uh, textbooks. Um, so the good news is we now have a bunch of new treatments that can bring down LDL levels, bring down triglyceride levels, bring them both down. Can also help to treat LP little a. We can do this through targeting RNA. We can do it through monoclonal antibodies. So the ideal target is something whose levels are high, are associated with risk. When you then knock the levels down, that lowers the risk. It improves the metabolic profile. And so the, you know, these uh, various agents uh, are listed on this slide, summarized here. So there are agents that lower PCSK9 and lower LDL, both monoclonal antibodies and SI interference, uh, so interfer RNA interfering drugs. Uh, uh, ANGPTL3, that if you lower that, it lowers both triglycerides and lowers LDL. Uh, LP little a, you can lower through targeting the, uh, the RNA of, of the APO uh, little a uh, message. And uh, APOC3 get profound reductions in triglycerides for those patients with very, very high triglyceride levels. So all of these drugs are in various uh, stages of clinical development, the RNA interference drugs, and we're in a very uh, exciting period where, where these are now uh, being uh, developed and uh, available in clinical trials. So in summary, uh, the dyslipidemias, you can think of them uh, rather than those Fredrickson types, it's either, you know, is it an LDL problem, is it a triglyceride problem, is it a combined, or is it one of the other, uh, one of the other dyslipidemias. There, uh, t when, you, when we list them, there's 25 genes, 25 disorders. The severe LDL increase is more often mo monogenic than polygenic. The triglyceride increase is way more often polygenic compared to monogenic. And we know that then the atherogenic lipids, LDL, uh, non-HDL, uh, moderate hypertriglyceridemia, LP little a, they all raise cardiovascular risk. Severe hypertriglyceridemia they raises pancreatitis risk. And we now have a number of ready for prime time RNA knockdown platforms, either through RNA interference or uh, so short interfering RNA or ASO in addition to our monoclonal antibodies. So thanks very, very much for your attention and thanks for the opportunity to speak at this amazing symposium. Okay, we're back uh, live. Thank you very much to the faculty for uh, those lectures. It's uh, a great pleasure for me personally to have uh, professors Hagley and Leader and Zinman with uh, Derek Yellen and myself. I won't tell you exactly how long I've known each one of these individuals, they'll be embarrassed, but it's at least 40 years, years. for all of you. And uh, it's good that we're all here. So I'm gonna ask the same question to all three of you, and I'm gonna just go age before beauty, which means Dr. Zinman's first, and then Dr. Leader, and then the most beautiful youngest <laughs> professor is Dr. Hagley. So here's my question. If we want to get bang for the buck in the next 10 years, and we want to reduce the complications of either type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, where should the effort be? We just heard these lectures. Uh, Bernie, you showed some complications data, and Larry and, and Rob really focused on how we've reduced the rates of complications. So, for example, is it glucose? Is it lipid? Is it inflammation? Is it something else? How would you, if your task was to further reduce the complications of type 1 and then type 2, where would you go in the next 10 years? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Dan. And really, you need to look at it as primary prevention, secondary intervention, and sort of tertiary treatment. And so the biggest bang for the buck for type 1 diabetes would be obviously to identify individuals who are at high risk who have islet cell antibodies, more than one, and to be able to prevent the development of diabetes, and then you'll prevent the microvascular complications. There's no question about that. For type two diabetes, the, the, it's really being driven uh, by obesity. So uh, changing that um, obesity epidemic uh, 
modifying that will have a huge impact on type 2 diabetes. In both type 1 and type 2, unfortunately, people do have this, these diseases. So effective therapies. And for type 1, we're getting close, uh, namely a closed loop system that's uh, easy to manage, uh, that's um, you know affordable. And in type 2, it, the exciting new therapies, not only do they lower glucose, they reduce cardiovascular events, they have impact on heart failure, they have impact on kidney disease. Uh, so, you know, it, it requires a three-pronged approach. Uh, and I think we're going to see advances in each one of those areas in the next uh, few uh, years. Okay, Larry, where would you spend the money? Yeah, so, so I think we've already made great strides and we're discussing with some of our residents the other day, you know, when we were training, you know, we commonly saw patients with uh, seeing eye dogs in the waiting room or amputations in the waiting room. That's unusual these days. And I would take a, a somewhat different tack than Bernie. We have highly effective therapies today. Uh, and I think the major challenge is the implementation. Uh, and sadly, surveys have shown that, you know, Whichever intervention we're looking at, you know, lipid lowering, blood pressure lowering, only 50% of our patients are a target. In terms of the use of a GLP-1 RA or SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, only about 20% of appropriate patients are on these therapies. So, would, yes, it would be wonderful to have additional drugs, but I think if we used our current drugs a lot more effectively, we would have dramatic benefit. So, Rob, I'm going to spin it to you now, but I'm going to add a little twist for you. Um, you're the precision medicine, precision genetics expert. And where is that going to fall out for type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Are we going to actually be able to predict and or tailor our therapies going forward? Because so far, it's been fascinating research. It hasn't really as Larry would say, being implemented yet. What are your thoughts on that? And I, and can... So I, th I think, uh, Dan, so first of all, thanks for inviting me. I mean, this is like a, a huge honor to be to be part of this. Um, but so I, I think there's going to be, I think there's going to be a subset where the, where the precision model is going to apply. And like one example we already have is with Modi diabetes. So that, you know, that it, where you can genetically define you know, if it's HNF-based MODI versus glucokinase-based MODI, then, then you, you, I mean, you, you can actually use a sulfonyl urea, you know that it's, that's going to work. So th there will be examples like that, but it's not going to be, it's, I mean, I think implementation of precision is not going to be a population-wide approach. I, I agree with Larry, and this is like a big thing in the lipid world now, is just, you know, getting people to, to take their therapy, implementation, science. You know, in Canada, we call it knowledge translation. The Americans have now come up with implementation science, but I, I think it's just branding. I think it's the, the sort of the same idea. Um, but I think where technology is going to help us is that there are going to be th these newer therapies that, are, that, that, like, for example, a once a year or, one, you know, or very intermittent or maybe one, one and you're done injection, uh, which will, like, for the rest of your life, take care of your... Uh, take care of, say, your elevated LDL, and then that, then you 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 can uh, you know sort of take the compliance part out of it, and then the other part of it is is of course accessibility and and cost. So I think it's it's going to be a combination of factors where we use science and technology to help with implementation. So, so Bernie, trial net investigators um, are pushing for population-wide testing of everybody with antibodies. This, this current notion of just testing family members at, at risk, they would like to see everybody in the world have their insulin antibodies tested so they can really start to enact a, a primary prevention model with the newer therapies coming on board. What are your thoughts on how practical yeah. or when that's going to happen? So, you know, it's, it's actually quite interesting because if you look at the last few decades, um, the management of type 1 diabetes has changed dramatically with CGM, closed loop systems are on the threshold. I think they're actually there. It's just a matter of them being implemented. So the bar for the safety of an immunological intervention has changed dramatically. 
You look at the steno data that I showed, when complications were so prevalent and devastating as Larry talked about, uh, the bar was different for the potential adverse effects of an immune therapy. Uh, now that immune therapy has to be pretty squeaky clean in order to come up against what we use for managing type one diabetes. Patients do very, very well uh, with our current um, insulins, monitoring pumps. Um, so it, it's gonna be tough. It's, it's sort of a, a race between an immunological intervention uh, early on, as opposed to a mechanical solution. And also brings up the whole question of what stem cells and beta cell, uh, you know, transplants, et cetera. So it's an exciting time. So I'm gonna ask Larry and, and Rob for a, their crystal ball. We often hear about residual risk. So let's just assume for a minute, we've treated the blood pressure, we've treated the lipids, we've got an antiplatelet agent. We still know there is residual risk in a lot of our people. And we've had some thoughts about screening for inflammation and then targeting inflammation. Where, where do you see this concept going and how much room is there to reduce that additional residual risk with you know, therapies and development? I'll start with Larry and then go to Rob. I mean, there certainly is room. I mean, if you, if you look at you know, event rates, uh, certainly in someone with diabetes and prior CVD, um, you're still talking about a few percent per year event rates, like you know, 20 to 30% over 10 years. So there's a lot of room for further event reduction. We're gonna hear uh, later in the meeting about uh, you know, interventions to reduce inflammation. Uh, we have drugs to reduce LP little a around the corner. Uh, time will tell which of these interventions are most effective, but I don't think there will be a single one. And I think we'll continue to go broader and broader uh, in terms of how many interventions we'll require in a given patient. And that obviously raises its own challenges. Rob, where would you go with residual risk? Yeah, so I think, so another, another term I've heard is persistent risk. So this is now, again, this is this, this rebranding exercise where like in 2021, I guess post-COVID residual risk becomes persistent risk, but it's the same thing. Um, so I, I, I mean, so there are examples. I mean, uh, I think for some people, for example, the people with super high LP little a that uh, that Larry mentioned. Now you don't need to do a DNA test for that, although you can find it with DNA. It's, it's a blood test. But but then yeah, there there's a there's a there's a lot of room in, in those patients. It's only maybe three to five percent of the population that would have a a level so high that. that that it might make a clinical difference, but you would want to. You you wouldn't want to let them go. Now we're letting them go. They come into my clinic. They've got like no risk factors. Like you know, they've got a family history, but you know, even their their, their regular cholesterol is fine. But they've got an LP little a that's off the map. So if we had, uh, if if we had a treatment for that person, and and, and then that's one type of residual risk that you would need to look for and that you know could be an example of like that precision medicine that you were mentioning earlier so there so there may be other examples like that and, and so it, it's going to be managed also informatically so when a person comes in and they're assessed for cardiovascular risk not only are they going to have their polygenic risk score done and you know maybe their 25 dollar whole exome done, you know, and and then all of these serum, uh, you know, inflammatory markers, serological markers, and, and then not for everybody, but for those that are at the extreme of the distribution, uh, you, 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 you would then direct your therapy. You can't use, you can't use everything in everybody, but you, you would have, uh, you know, some, some targeting. Right. So that's Derek is waving, Derek is waving his pencil at me, which makes me nervous. So Derek, jump in. You're muted. Might be muted. My, my apologies. We're getting quite a few questions coming in. It'd be nice to hear from some of the delegates. This I'll read out the two questions, uh, and and you know who you are should be able to answer them. Number one was: Are there is there strong evidence that certain newer insulins, Bernie? Maybe you can take this. Have less propensity to induce neutralizing antibody formation. And the second question is, we have an embarrassment of Richard or evidence, and the corollary is an embarrassment of expenses. 
should more genetic testing be available to identify patients who, uh, who should be supported by public funding of medications? I can repeat those again in a minute. Bernard, what about the insulin? I'll take the first one. Yeah, so I think the newer insulins, uh, of course, uh, uh, are have less uh, antibody uh, formation. I mean, I'm, uh, as Dan pointed out, old enough to remember uh, when uh, antibody uh, insulin resistance was a real problem, where we'd have to infuse um, hundreds of units of insulin to overcome the antibody uh, problem, and then all of a sudden the antibodies went away, and there was lots of hypoglycemia. So we don't we don't have that problem. We don't see that anymore. We don't see type ones needing hundreds of units of insulin. So I think that's good. However, it's not physiologic, and that's the challenge that I try to highlight. That giving insulin under the skin, even though it's modified to have good pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, it's not really physiologic. Uh, and the question is, how physiologic do you have to get? Does it really have to get into the portal vein? And we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Oh, thanks very much, Bernie. The the other one question was, um, uh, should genetic testing be more available to identify patients uh, yeah. who should be supported by public funding or medications? Yeah. Rob, is that well, if, you ask, yeah, if you if you ask me, I'm going to be I'm biased towards it. But the one <laughs> thing with genetic testing. Even now, when, when when we run our lipid panels, so I run the lipid panel on everybody. I've done like four thousand of them. It's three. It's about three hundred and fifty dollars, but that's a one-time expense. We don't have to keep going back and repeating the genetic testing. It's a one-time expense, and when you weigh that against the cost, say, of one dose of a monoclonal antibody, which then you know is given like you know uh, twenty-four times a year, so it, it's a small investment, but still it's money that does, it would be new money to be putting into the healthcare system. So I think we have, you know, I think we, uh, so I agree. I think, you know, genetics is already helping, uh, you know, make uh, improving access, but, you know, we, we it, it's like everything that technology is, is raising the cost of everything. Okay, um, I, we, I've just been uh, alluded to the fact we've got one minute left. Let me just quickly throw something in, Bernard, if you don't mind, Bernard. Uh, you gave a brilliant lecture, uh, 100 Years of Insulin. It really was interesting, and and uh, that was the last century. If you were living another 100 years, <laughs> and I'd like you to live another 100 years, do you think some of the drugs that are coming out today, because pharmacology in this area has, is relatively short-lived. I'm talking type 2 diabetes as right. opposed to type 1. Would you see that the era that we're in now might deserve a, a lecture in 100 years' time? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, boy, in 100 years, uh, they're going to look back and, and laugh at, at the kind of primitive approaches we've had to treating uh, type 1 diabetes and metabolic disease in general. Uh, you know, the the kind of advances one can anticipate uh, uh, are going to be dramatic and they're going to involve genetics and, and all kinds of precision medicine, et cetera. So it, it, it'll be an exciting time for our great, great grandchildren to participate in. I, I think, gentlemen, I, I'm, I'm getting sort of messages that we've got to Move on. So can I and Dan and I, uh, Dan, you want to finish with anything? Just really thank you three for a brilliant opening. Oh, and to this and meeting. the next time we're going to all meet together. Derek's very generous. He just gives his credit card to the bartender, and we're going to have a really good meeting next year. Absolutely, no problem. He says. Good. <laughs> thank you so much. So, okay, so, so that's the end of our first session. Um, uh, but there's a lot more to come. And uh, let me hand over to my co-chairs, John Cunningham and Mark Pfeffer, John Cunningham from London, Mark from, from Boston, that you all know. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good evening, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues in Canada. Um, here we are, I'm a nephrologist in London. I'm one of the, the relatively few nephrologists uh, uh, taking part in this meeting, but I'm glad to see a smattering uh, of you around. Um, <clears throat> The next two talks, though, have a distinctly cardiovascular uh, uh, flavor to them. The two speakers are individuals with very high profiles. Um, uh, you, we have uh, Peter Libby from Boston and John Deanfield in London. Um, I'm not going to dwell on their CVs, which are frighteningly impressive in both cases. 
Um, but suffice to say that there is very good alignment between the CVs and the subject matter that they're going to address. Um, and so I think we're in for uh, a treat. Uh, we're starting with uh, Peter Libby, um, uh, who is going to address the topic of um, um, uh, cardiac ath atheroma at the limits. Are we fighting the final battle? And we're going to be followed by John Deanfield addressing the topic of primordial cardiology in youth. What are the limits? So we'll now move on to those two talks in, in sequence. It's my pleasure to join this uh, Canadian edition of Cardiology, Diabetes and Nephrology at the Limits. Uh, this is a virtual meeting and I hope the next time we meet, it will be in person. These are my competing interests. So I'm going to fast forward to the bottom line. Although we've made terrific advances in cardiovascular risk management, we've by no means reached the limits. The burden of residual risk is far too high. Of course, our uh, terra cognita, uh, our comfort zone is LDL, low density like protein, uh, which is a causal risk factor for atherosclerosis and satisfies uh, modified Cook's postulates with uh, association studies, human genetic studies, and intervention studies that show us that lowering LDL can improve cardiovascular outcomes. But the, the palette of tools that we have for addressing high LDL has grown remarkably and very satisfyingly. They're not only the statins and azetamide, which uh, blocks cholesterol absorption from the intestine, but bempedoic acid that blocks cholesterol synthesis, a little bit proximal to the site of statin action, and the anti-PCSK9 agents, both the biologicals and the RNA therapeutics that are very exciting because they can be given just twice or once a year. Uh, so in the case of LDL, we are reaching the limits. We can drive LDL down uh, to very low levels and reap clinical benefit. But there's uh, much more to lipid risk than just LDL. Uh, there are triglyceride-rich lipoproteins or remnants, and we actually discarded them as a causal risk factor for years because we adjusted them for HDL, and of course, HDL and triglycerides vary inversely. And the current uh, failure of pharmacologic studies to raise HDL and the current human genetic landscape do not provide support for HDL's protective effect as fervently as we believed it in the past, including myself. Um, but the human genetic evidence that has come out in the last few years strongly supports triglyceride-rich lipoproteins as causal. So I would have you uh, consider that we bet on the wrong side of this teeter-totter uh, between HDL and triglycerides and confuse the dependent and independent variable when we adjusted the cardiovascular risk of triglycerides for HDL. That opens a door towards treating hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, one way to do it is with fish oils. And this study with a highly purified uh, pharmaceutical quality control grade of uh, icosapentaethyl was able to decrease cardiovascular events. But there's more to the success of the REDUCE IT trial than triglycerides, as there was no heterogeneity in the cardiovascular benefit depending on baseline triglyceride levels. And study which I'm involved with called a prominent is looking at a selective PPAR alpha modulator, pemifibrate, now directed towards a hypertriglyceridemic population, uh, which has not been done before in trials of agents of this ilk. And uh, we hope to be able to give you an answer about whether targeting uh, triglycerides and other aspects of risk with this uh, novel agent in a uh, hypertriglyceridemic population will yield cardiovascular benefits. Of course, there are very exciting novel targets, which have emerged actually from human genetics as well as observation, uh, that will allow us to expand our palette of anti-lipid measurements measures, and that is uh, LP little a, uh, two RNA therapeutics that are in trials, and plt 3 and apoprotein C3, again, promising genetically-based targets for which therapies are emerging. But beyond lipids, we have uh, inflammation. Uh, there's a very strong body of preclinical evidence that we need to translate to people. 
The first uh, shot on that goal was the Cantos trial that targeted interleukin-1 beta. And in an on-treatment analysis, looking at those who actually responded to the drug shown in green, uh, we see an over 30% decrease in cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality, the holy grail of clinical trials. Uh, we have other anti-inflammatory agents, such as colchicine, which have recently shown clinical benefit in the Colcott trial and those who are soon after myocardial infarction who showed a clinical benefit. This is a trial led in Canada by Jean-Claude Tardif and his Canadian team. And Ludoco2, uh, that uh, study individuals with sustained myocardial infarction but were in the stable phase, also showing a benefit. Uh, where are we going to go in the future? I think that a lot of arrows point at this pathway from the inflammasome, which generates active IL-1 beta, through to IL-6. And we're fortunate because we have novel agents that are able to address this pathway more distally, perhaps preventing uh, some of the infectious complications due to interruption of host defenses if you target more proximally. There is a large scale study uh, which is uh, going to kick off based on a phase two trial which uh, will be presented at the American College of Cardiology uh, using uh, ziltabecumab, a anti-IL-6 antibody. Uh, finally, there's a very exciting uh, new recognition of somatic mutations that occur in the bone marrow in stem cells that give rise to clones of leukocytes in peripheral blood that bear mutations in a small subset of known leukemia driver genes. And we've learned that the path to acute leukemia is paved with increased cardiovascular disease. Here we see the prevalence of clonal hematopoiesis increasing markedly with age. And if we look at people who have these clones, they have an almost twofold increase, fully adjusted for traditional risk factors of cardiovascular events. And that's on par with uh, diabetes and even um, greater than with total cholesterol or systolic blood pressure. Uh, so finally, there's a big basket of uh, residual risk that we can uh, address uh, with uh, new agents that have been developed as anti-diabetic drugs, but that I would have you consider are cardiovascular drugs, and that is the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors, about which you'll be hearing a lot in other talks in this meeting. So uh, we have to get these therapies adopted, and we have to do so in an equitable manner. Those are remaining obstacles that are extra scientific. And let me close by thanking my funders and the team uh, that I've had the privilege of working with through many decades to uh, address these issues. Thank you very much. My name is Professor John Deanfield, and it's a real pleasure to be here talking to you about primordial cardiology in the youth, what are the limits? Now we're in the middle of a real revolution in healthcare. And that revolution is based on a shift from just disease management to wellness maintenance. Now, why is this becoming so important now? As we emerge from COVID and the pandemic, we all realize how important our background cardiovascular health is for our future uh, wellness. And we've learned a number of things that really support this shift towards earlier intervention for disease prevention. The first important thing is that cardiovascular disease begins in the young due to ex early exposure to risk factors, long before the clinical manifestations of the disease. Secondly, we've learned that earlier management to reduce lifetime exposure to cardiovascular risk factors leads to less atherosclerosis and fewer later cardiovascular events. This is something that I've called investing in your arteries. Now, to achieve the benefits of this type of strategy, prevention will require a national policy to empower the public from youth to understand better their cardiovascular risk and at the same time understand their opportunities for lifetime benefit from early risk factor change. Now, we've long had evidence that individuals 
dying of non-cardiac disease sometimes have unexpectedly high levels of atherosclerosis in their coronary and peripheral circulations. And this was nicely shown in a study by Murat Tuju at the Cleveland Clinic when he used intravascular ultrasound to characterize the coronary arteries of young Americans dying of non-cardiovascular diseases whose hearts were being used in the Cleveland Clinic transplant program. You can see on the left a 32-year-old woman who died in a car accident near Cleveland, and you can see how impressive her early atherosclerosis is, even at this early asymptomatic phase of the disease. Now, we could speculate how many of us on this call already have arteries that look like this, but actually you don't have to speculate too much because if you look at the right-hand panel, you see the burden of atherosclerosis at different ages in around 300 individuals dying of non-cardiac related causes. In the modern era, about one in five teenagers in the United States already have early atherosclerosis. And rather worryingly, for the hearts in those who died above the age of 50, 85% of them had evidence of established atherosclerotic disease. So exposure to cardiovascular risk factors in the young during that long preclinical period is the driver of this accelerating atherosclerosis that eventually leads to clinical complications. Now, I would love to be able to show you a randomized clinical trial that proved that early lowering of cardiovascular risk factors resulted in fewer later clinical events. But of course, that sort of trial is not feasible. But it's here that genetics have really helped us understand both the causal pathway to future atherosclerosis and also the opportunities from early intervention. This is a beautiful study that Brian Ferenc and colleagues did in UK Biobank. When they looked at gene profiles associated with LDL cholesterol levels and with blood pressure and their impact on future cardiovascular outcome. Now there are multiple genes that affect our blood pressure levels and if you have a favorable blood pressure genetic profile that results in a small but sustained lowering of your blood pressure, there is an almost 20% lowering in future cardiovascular events. Similarly, if you're born with a favorable genetic profile for LDL cholesterol, a modest lowering of LDL cholesterol as a result translates to an almost 30% reduction in future cardiovascular gain. If you're lucky enough to be born with both a favorable blood pressure genetic profile and a favorable profile for LDL cholesterol, that gain is almost 60%. Now, if you look in the lower panel here, this is the impact of having a gene profile that results in a 10 millimeter lower blood pressure over your life and an almost 40 milligrams per deciliter lower LDL cholesterol. If you can achieve those two levels of risk factor lowering, the relationship with future cardiovascular outcomes was very impressive, an almost 80% reduction in future cardiovascular events. What this suggests to us is that arterial disease causing heart attacks and strokes may be largely preventable by early intervention. When we talk to patients, we talk about it being never too late to do something about their cardiovascular risk. What I'm suggesting to you today is that it's never too early. Now, how early should we be thinking about modifying cardiovascular risk factors? Well, sadly, cardiovascular risk factors begin to emerge in the population during teenage years and early adult life. This is a slide that shows you a, the relationship between BMI during adolescence and future cardiovascular outcome. And you can see that obesity levels in the first and second decade of life relate to cumulative cardiovascular mortality in future years. That relationship is largely driven by the development of diabetes and hypertension, potentially modifiable cardiovascular risk factors by early intervention. As a medical profession, we have a challenge in communicating to the public the opportunities that they have from sustained beneficial changes in their lifestyle for future cardiovascular risk. And it's fair to say we haven't done a great job up to now. What we've done is talk a lot about risk, but not too much talk about opportunities and benefit.
Now, risk calculators are moving from an assessment of short-term risk that we've used in clinical practice to an assessment of communication of lifetime risk. What's changed is our understanding of the investment opportunity from early intervention of the type I've showed you in terms of future gain. We've moved from calculators that used estimates from observational effects on cholesterol, which showed modest benefit, through to calculators like the Joint British Society calculator that used effects from randomized clinical trials, to novel approaches using the benefits seen from Mendelian randomization studies, as I've showed you, which really emphasize how dramatic the opportunities from early intervention are. In the future, we will be personalizing risk prediction and communication with the public, and we're nowhere near the limits of opportunities in that regard with development of novel imaging, biomarkers, and genetics to further support our prediction of future cardiovascular risk and opportunities for treatment. So we as a medical profession are going to have to change our role in the future in terms of healthcare. It's no longer sufficient to treat disease better. We have to get involved in personalized prevention for our patients and indeed the public. And we have to act as advocates for societal change for the benefit of the population. So in conclusion, this really is a disruptive moment for cardiovascular disease prevention. We're not at the limits, we're just beginning, and this is going to transform the healthcare environment. We're moving from a disease care system to embrace wellness maintenance, and that is going to require a change in approach from us as doctors, but also politicians, public funders, and private health providers. The challenge is to develop a partnership with the public and the patients to develop a system that allows best and affordable care for prevention over their lifetime so that we can achieve what Ernest Winder wrote very nicely a few years ago, that it should be the function of medicine to have people die young as late as possible. Thank you for your attention. John, if uh, you're not taking it, I will, because I was stuck in the waiting room uh, with, uh, with Peter. So if I'm going to be stuck any place, it was the right place. So Peter and John Deanfield, you guys just gave uh, beautiful lectures about uh, the whole extent of atherosclerosis. And I want to use a quick summary here and let you both shoot me. Peter, you were years ago, plaque rupture, plaque erosion. Uh, so how to live with atherosclerosis and die from something else. And John, how not even to have atherosclerosis. So can I take Peter's approach and save a lot of money? Who's that to? That's, is that to Peter? Well, I'm throwing to both of you, but I was asking you, John, uh, how much money would it cost to take your approach versus Peter's approach and let's just start and not have events. Let, let, let me start since there seems to be an awkward silence here. Um, the late Lewis Thomas, uh, the great essayist and uh, biologist, uh, he got a pacemaker at one point and he was marveling at it, but then he was thinking about it and said, this is halfway technology. If we really understood cardiovascular disease, we wouldn't need pacemakers. And that uh, as we evolve the more and more complex technologies, <clears throat> including the, uh, the ventricular assist devices and all kinds of other complex machinery, it's really an admission of our failure to solve the fundamental problem, which is mastering the biology of the disease. We have the knowledge, and John is pointing the way so that we can make the machinery obsolete. And it was Lewis Thomas who said that it, uh, the allocation of these therapies is um, ethically puzzling and impossibly expensive. So I'm with John for primordial prevention. The problem is it's too late for you and me and many of our patients. John so, Cunningham, are, are you allowing me to ask another or can we? Yeah, well, I, 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 just one I'd like to fire in um, that links in with that, if I may quickly. Um, and uh, it's to do with this, again, this concept of residual risk and um, knocking that one right down. Now, 
John, your approach there is essentially to try and kill it off at birth, essentially, and eliminate residual risk from the off. Whereas I think implicit in a lot of what you're talking about, Peter, is to devise understanding and mechanisms for dealing with it when it's already arisen. Now, we talk about maybe a 30% residual risk or something like that. Is the implication of lowering that that you have to reverse established processes, or can you achieve that by halting ongoing processes? Because it seems to me the former of those two is, has been incredibly difficult, and the latter a good deal easier. So that maybe I can comment briefly. I, I think Peter's talk and my talk are entirely compatible because in clinical practice, we see patients at different stages in the evolution of atherosclerosis. What Peter's talking about is translating novel information into reducing the, uh, the damaging impact of atherosclerosis biology on future risk and the plethora of new treatments that will actually be able to target that residual risk that we see in patients. What I'm talking about is preventing the evolution of atherosclerosis over that long preclinical period and hopefully never getting into the stage where we have to use some of those very expensive and complex interventions. Well, even in something as uh, pretty late stage as heart failure, many people die of non-CV events. So, uh, you know, we're just going to shift things around. Uh, we like to think that cardiovascular uh, disease is the biggest burden until 2020 and 21 when COVID became <laughs> and put us in our place. And don't forget infectious diseases. So I'm just putting that out here because I'm sitting at home uh, because of that. <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to give a talk now without mentioning COVID. But just remember also, Mark, that in the COVID era, the biggest determinant of adverse outcome is your background health and predominantly your cardiovascular risk profiles as well. So you can't separate this accumulated burden of background disease from the COVID pandemic. John Cunningham, I've learned never debate somebody who comes from the UK. It always, <laughs> you, it always sounds better. Now, do we have questions from our very large audience? And would, who, who would they go to? They go to you, John Cunningham? I'll go to either either of us, um, okay. but I'm not seeing any at the moment. Okay. Um, they'll, they'll come up on a screen. So if those of you in the audience, feel free to fire questions in, please. We'll see them and uh, uh, and uh, parrot them out to our speakers. Because I, I don't think our audience knows the at the limits. We really are trying to push our speakers to tell us what the limits. And John, they both gave us that. They both did give us the limits. But, you know, even for primordial prevention, we need to harness biology because there's so many open questions about what intervention for what kind of person, uh, who should get extra virgin olive oil, who should get eicosapentaenoic acid, uh, for, for whom would this or that preventive measure be appropriate. So as we move towards uh, personalized medicine, uh, we really can harness, uh, we should be harnessing genetics uh, to direct the therapies and prioritize what those lifestyle interventions would be to deploy early in life. John, uh, J John Deanfield, can I just uh, ask you one thing? Um, presumably, the I think I'm correct in saying that you can pick at a very, very early age the uh, centile that people's blood pressure is going to track, that their LDL is going to track, et cetera. In other words, that predict the rate of accumulation of risk in the coming years at a very early stage. And I don't think that's rocket science anymore. Um, given the thesis behind what you're saying, when would you actually start intervening um, uh, on those kids? And we're talking about intervening with young children potentially there to get the maximum gain. How would you put that into practice? So it's a really good, it's a really good question, John, because the, the thesis that I'm proposing today is that these interventions don't have to be medical interventions that if you're talking about altering the trajectory to future risk and those profiles, then small changes early that are sustained produce dramatic leverage gains later on. It's the compound interest from early intervention. So I think what you could be doing is changing uh, education, changing behavior in the young with a whole range of different things. And I think we've neglected that at our cost and are just beginning to realize how important early lifestyle changes are gonna be if they're able to be introduced early and sustained over long periods of time. 
So I would argue that it doesn't sound very exciting for a medical meeting that changing the school curriculum, explaining to children how they ought to be eating, behaving, doing family education is going to be a huge investment for the future and highly cost effective. But obviously, we can start to talk now about people who are going on the wrong trajectory for future risk factors and lowering risk factors early by medical intervention may be necessary. And as Peter Libby said, in the future, we may be able to personalize that much more by understanding genetics and the interaction with environmental risk. Well, zip code has a lot to do with your risk as well. Hmm. And uh, we're starting to see more and more papers about that where people can tell you the particulate matter and the different zip codes and uh, and disease profiles uh, not not accounted for by what we call conventional risk factors. Yeah. So there is a question from uh, one of the attendees in our chat here. Do you guys see that? I don't see it. Let, so let me repeat it. Okay. And this is for John, um, although I can answer it too. Uh, <laughs> the data the data showing baseline atherosclerosis seem to have been collected prior to 2001. Is there any evidence that more recent population health strategies to either one, discourage smoking, or two, encourage exercise or change the baseline prevalence of athro? Um, I haven't seen any recent data from pathology studies that changes this idea that this becomes established early on. Um, so I don't know, Peter, if you've seen data from that. Certainly, there's really interesting data now, though, that obesity levels may actually be plateauing in the United States, for example, particularly in the young, due to concerted attempts at public health. And hopefully that will translate to a benefit down the line. But I'm not sure I've seen any evidence from the pathology as yet, Peter. Have you? Well, I think that the gist of the question is that we base a lot of our risk assessment on data that was accumulated before the high prevalence of statins in the community. For example, all of our data about uh, carotid nardirectomy, I think, were obsolete. And mm. I, I think that uh, you know, optimum medical therapy uh, would give us a completely different, today's optimum medical therapy would give us a completely different uh, idea of comparing surgery uh, versus, say, aspirin, uh, as in the old days. So yes, a lot of our control data uh, databases are obsolete, given the excellence of care and the evolving Clinical care. You know, now we've entered the era of being able to drive the LDL into the nether regions. Uh, we're about to do it even more conveniently and cost effectively. Um, we're going to attack uh, that frustrating final frontier of LP little a. And then we have this new world, uh, and people in this meeting are absolute leaders in this of the GLP 1 uh, receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors. Mark's in the thick of this uh, in the uh, periacute infarct. Uh, and we'll have exciting data for us very shortly. Um, so really, the, the baseline keeps changing, yet we base all of our calculations on antique data. You know what's interesting to me? So this is at the limits, uh, cardiology, nephrology, diabetes. Everything you two were talking about in those lectures carry over to diabetes and nephrology. Right. Absolutely, and it may well be possible. I was interested in the discussion in the first session when we people were talking and predicting what will be the next advances, and it was very often around expensive drugs in the late management of the disease. But actually, um, someone said very perceptively, I think, that if you can control your weight and the relationship between weight and the evolution of type 2 diabetes doesn't look the same as cholesterol and, and blood pressure, which seems to be cumulative exposure, there may be a threshold of weight which is personalized, above which glycemic control begins to go wrong and risk of diabetes goes up. So with these exciting weight management strategies, it may be possible to personalize a threshold by which, uh, below which you can keep your weight and actually prevent the evolution of diabetes. And I think this is going to be very exciting in the future. John Cunningham, can I also say, since we're at the limits, we always travel. We we go to your country. Uh, when I get off a plane in the in Europe, I notice more smoking, and when I come back, I notice more obesity. So it's it's totally regional, also. It certainly is, and of course, it uh, the the odd thing is that the the heaviest smoking uh, this side of the pond is in southern Europe. Um, where cardiovascular mortality is low. Uh, it's also very heavy in Eastern Europe, where cardiovascular mortality is extremely high. But the rest of the diet is completely different in, the, in those two zones.
But um, now I've got a question here I've just seen, which is quite an interesting one. Um, uh, it's a question and a comment, actually. And uh, somebody is saying, um, why aren't we allowed to translate what we learn from secondary prevention trials, uh, in other words, late disease, um, into reasonable strategies for primary prevention, given that the primary, primary prevention trials are often just not going to get done because they're too big, too expensive, too long. Um, and this person is really pleading for a change in the philosophy of those that uh, uh, write guidelines, etc. Mm -hmm. Quite good, good point, I think. What do, what do you think, good gentlemen? Both, both our speakers. So I'm a massive advocate for that because if you think about uh, disease management, prevention is clearly better than treatment. It's clearly more cost effective and, and, uh, and a much better option. The problem is it's much harder to get the trial evidence so that we can achieve that with interventions. But for sure, that's where I think we've learned a lot from genetics in terms of the evolution of disease and causal pathways. So I showed you the, the data from Brian Ferenc's analysis of the UK Biobank data, which really does uh, push us towards this idea that we should be translating these concepts back to earlier intervention, not necessarily with medications. We're often accused of trying to medicalize the whole population. But actually, if you believe in this concept, you might be able to avoid ever having the statin conversation with your doctor by better lifestyle sustained for longer. Well, I love this question. Uh, it's very perceptive and very provocative. And I agree that we may never have the randomized control clinical trial evidence uh, in primary prevention with many of the lifestyle interventions. So my stance is to uh, imitate Blaise Pascal, Le Paris Pascal, Pascal's wager. Uh, you know, he, Pascal said, okay, uh, if there is a God and I believe in God, um, then I win. If there is no God and I believe in God, I don't lose. But if there is a God and I don't believe in God, then I'm in big trouble. So I think uh, I, I take the Pascal's wager stance to lifestyle interventions in primary prevention. Okay, well, I think we probably need to wrap that one up now. Um, great talks uh, and thank you very much both. Um, thank you uh, for your questions uh, uh, out there. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, thank you to my co-chairman as well, uh, Mark. Um, uh, we're now going to uh, move over to the next phase, um, which is the Pfizer uh, Industry Symposium. Interestingly enough, this is nothing to do with COVID vaccines, but it's about metformin. And I'm going to hand over to Stephanie Baldweg and Theresa McDonough, who are going to chair that session for you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jay Horton. I'm a gastroenterologist at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, and I'm here with my co-chair, uh, Alice Chang, who's associate professor in the Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of Toronto. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, industry satellite symposium. And everyone can see the slides now. Um, I'd like to, as I said, welcome everyone. Uh, this is being sponsored by Pfizer. And as shown in this slide, um, it's been 35 years since Brown and Goldstein were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discoveries, uh, which in quote was for the regulation of cholesterol metabolism. And this occurred in 1985. I believe this was the 13th Nobel Prize uh, that's been awarded uh, for uh, studies related to cholesterol. Uh, and shortly after the Nobel Prize was awarded, actually in 1987, Merck capitalized on many of their discoveries and ultimately developed lovastatin, which of course was the first statin that was approved for use in the United States for the treatment of hypercholesterolemia. Uh, the goal of the symposium is to highlight how subsequent studies in the field have led to the development of several new exciting therapeutic options uh, to both prevent and treat cardiovascular disease. So I'll now turn the program over. Uh, for further introductions to my co-chair, Dr. Alice Chang. Great, thank you very much, Professor Horton. And welcome to everyone to this symposium tonight. And, and it's my pleasure to share the stage with, uh, with these giants in their respective fields. And it's my pleasure to also introduce, uh, again, since you've already heard from both of them tonight already, uh, Professor Robert Hegley, as well as Professor Bernie Zinman, uh, both of whom our uh, friends, our colleagues, uh, as well as mentors. And in, in the case of Dr. Hegley, he is an endocrinologist as well as a lipidologist from Western University. 
And in the case of Dr. Zinman, he is also known as Uncle Zinman, or Uncle Bernie is what I like to call him as well. So he's certainly been a mentor of mine uh, for many years to come. So I look forward to hearing from both of them. And in terms of disclosure for tonight's symposium, uh, Pfizer provided financial support for this scientific exchange symposium. Presentations were developed by each faculty member independently of the sponsor, and each faculty member had full editorial control over the content of the presentation. And tonight, in terms of the lectures that you're going to hear from each of these uh, giants in their fields, the titles are listed for you here. I, I won't read them out to you, but they're going to be brief presentations because we wanted to make sure that there was lots of time for discussion. So I encourage all of you to please type in questions in the chat box and we'll be sure to address them. So without further ado, let's kick off the videos so that we can watch these lectures. Hello, I'm Jay Horton and I'm a professor of internal medicine and molecular genetics at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And I've been asked to discuss the evolving focus in the Department of Molecular Genetics uh, that has gone from the discovery of the LD receptor to PCSK9 to work in fatty liver disease. Here are my disclosures. So it's been 35 years since Brown and Goldstein were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery and characterization of the LD receptor. I've been asked to provide a brief summary of the work done in their department since they were awarded the prize. So I'll start with a classic slide <clears throat> that illustrates the thrust of their research efforts, both before and after being awarded the prize. Their primary goal has been to determine how cholesterol homeostasis is maintained within the cell and the whole organism. Their early work focused on two primary paths for cholesterol accumulation, endogenous synthesis and extracellular uptake, which of course is mediated by the elder receptor. Once the LD receptor was discovered, they demonstrated that cholesterol also regulates LD receptor expression and mRNA levels. So they then set out to identify the transcription factors responsible for this sterile mediated regulation. This led to the biochemical purification of SREBPs or sterile regulatory element binding proteins. These transcription factors were unexpectedly found to be membrane bound and they had to be cleaved in order to become active. Over the past 25 years, Brown and Goldstein have identified and characterized the key proteins that carry out this complex event. Central to cholesterol regulation is the SCAP protein, uh, which binds both cholesterol and SREBPs and serves as an escort protein that transports SREBPs to the Golgi where they are cleaved and subsequently activated. An additional focus in the department has been on the characterization of genes that are regulated by SREBPs. There are two SRBP isoforms, <clears throat> and work done in the department and by others have demonstrated that SRBP2 not only regulates the elder receptor, but it also regulates all enzymes involved in cholesterol biosynthesis. It was through array studies using livers of SRBP2 transgenic mice that we identified NEST, which turned out to be PS PCSK9, which was SRBP2 regulated. And ultimately, this protein was shown to post-transcriptionally regulate LDL receptor protein levels. The SRBP1 isoform was found to regulate all enzymes involved in fatty acid synthesis and the first enzyme in triglyceride synthesis. And it was the overexpression of SRBP1 that resulted in fatty livers, and it was this finding that ultimately served as the impetus for further studies that defined the contribution of de novo lipogenesis in the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Additional members in the department, Drs. Hobbs and Cohen, have used genetics to identify the function of new genes in lipid metabolism. They relied heavily on the Dallas Heart Study participants who agreed to have multiple phenotypic parameters measured, including plasma lipids, DNA, and NMR measurements of their liver fat. Using the DNA provided, Hobbs and Cohen identified loss of function mutations in PCSK9 that were associated with low blood LDL cholesterol levels, and subsequently they showed in a different large population that those harboring the loss of function mutations had an 88% reduction in cardiovascular events. They've also used GWAS studies from the Dallas Heart Study to identify variation in gene sequences that are associated with high liver triglycerides. A variation in PMPLA3 was identified that was present in more than 20% of the population. This is a lipase, and others have subsequently showed that this polymorphism in PMPLA3 is not only associated with hepatic steatosis, but also with NASH, cirrhosis, and the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Ironically, 
PNPLA3 expression is also regulated by SRABP1, which brings us back to the same fundamental pathway. So in summary, the research carried out in the department has continued to focus on defining how cholesterol regulates whole body cholesterol homeostasis at the molecular level. The characterization of genes regulated by SRBPs have led to the characterization of PCSK9 and to defining the role of SRBP regulated genes in the development of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Both pathways are now being exploited to treat hypercholesterolemia and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease respectively. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to address any questions. Hi, good evening. I'm Rob Hegley from the University of Western Ontario. In the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking to you about new drug targets for cardiovascular disease. These are my disclosures for this evening. The drug targets, PCSK9, APOC3, ApoA, or LP little a, ANGPTL3, have all been shown through genetic research primarily to be risk factors for atherosclerosis, and some of them are actually acting through lipid levels. And these then, when, when we know that the levels of these uh, targets are high, if we can knock them down, uh, we can reduce risk. And so the, not, the strategies to knock down are through uh, RNA interference in some way or monoclonal antibodies. Now just uh, to remind you, there are two ways of targeting RNA. You can target it in the cytoplasm using a short interfering RNA or you can target it closer to the nucleus using an ASO or an, uh, a, a little specific oligonucleotide. So the first drug target is PCSK9, very, very well known to you. There are already two drugs in the market around the world. Uh, these uh, target PCSK9 that is circulating using a monoclonal antibody approach. There is now a new way to target PCSK9, and that's using the RNA interference approach, and that's within the cell, and that's this agent in Clizaran. So Clizaran is a short interfering RNA. In this particular study, it was given four times over an 18-month period. It reduced LDL cholesterol by 50%, sustained reductions, and uh, in fact, it's very, very likely that this drug will be approved uh, quite soon in North America and around the world. Uh, the second target, ANGPTL3, angiopoietin-like 3 protein. Through genetic studies, we know that individuals who are deficient in, uh, in, in this particular protein have low levels of lipid, so that uh, both triglycerides and LDL, so that by targeting it, uh, either through antibodies or through RNA, we try to recapitulate this beneficial human phenotype. Uh, so there is a drug, a monoclonal antibody, Evanacumab, which amazingly lowers LDL in patients with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. Another drug that targets RNA, buprenorphine, similarly lowers uh, triglycerides and lowers uh, LDL. Uh, and lower, it basically causes improvement in multiple lipid uh, fractions. So these are both now primed to be tested in actual uh, cardiovascular risk reduction studies. The third uh, uh, target you may have heard of, LP little a or APO little a. So this is an LDL-like particle that raises risk, also liver secreted. It can be now targeted specifically through uh, RNA targeting. So this is uh, pelicarsen and again showing a dose-related uh, response. And these people, uh, for the first time, can get extremely uh, uh, amazing reductions in LP little a. Uh, so this is now ready for prime time to be tested uh, in cardiovascular outcome studies. And then finally, APOC3, a drug or a target that is associated with high levels of triglyceride. So a number of uh, monoclonal antibodies or a number of RNA interference drugs now that lower APOC3 and lower triglycerides by 80 to 90 percent. So the, the four targets, there are various evidence, both from so, of genetic evidence, other kinds of scientific evidence, the names of the drugs, the targets, they're all shown on this slide, the effects on the lipid profile. Some of them have already been shown to have effects on cardiovascular disease. So the ideal target to be targeted either by a monoclonal antibody or by RNA interference are liver secreted, they raise risk, so then when you knock them down, you can lower risk. There's fantastic evidence for the four targets that I've talked about this evening. These actually then work by reducing uh, the end product, the lipid level, LDL, triglyceride, LP little a. Uh, if the triglycerides are severely elevated, there's risk for pancreatitis, and so that's another clinical endpoint that can be helped. So we are now on the verge of having ready for prime time RNA interference drugs.
Uh, for the future, we, talk, we can talk about gene editing, uh, but that's a topic for another day. Thanks for your attention. Hello, I'm Bernie Zinman, and I'm delighted to participate in this uh, symposium. Uh, I am a senior scientist at the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. My topic is evolving science in cardiovascular risk reduction in type 2 diabetes. My disclosures are shown on this slide and I serve as a consultant and receive honoraria from companies that are involved in diabetes research. Now life expectancy is reduced in patients with diabetes. And this slide shows that for a 60-year-old individual, having diabetes and cardiovascular disease means a 12-year reduction in life expectancy. Quite dramatic. Now, heart failure is often not recognized as a common complication of diabetes, cardiovascular complication of diabetes. And what we see here is that for individuals with type 2 diabetes, who are using insulin, so that means that they're pretty far advanced in the course of diabetes, there is much more heart failure uh, occurring than myocardial infarction or stroke, and heart failure can have very devastating consequences. So if you were thinking about a diabetes therapy and you were uh, having a wish list, this is what uh, it could look like. You want effective glucose lowering, low risk of hypoglycemia, no weight gain, complementary mechanisms of action with other diabetes therapies, safety, well tolerated, and I've shown here in bold some of the added value which would really be a bonus if a diabetes therapy had a beneficial effect on lipids, had a beneficial effect on beta cell function, and actually changed cardiovascular outcomes. That the molecule itself was special. And indeed, the concern by the FDA at the time was with respect to safety because there were diabetes therapies like thiazolidinediols that were associated with increase in heart failure with a concern that there may be an increase in cardiovascular safety. And here you see a whole slew of trials involving hundreds of thousands of patients of the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the SGLT2 inhibitors, and the DPP-4 inhibitors. I'm gonna focus principally on the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT2 inhibitors. So the world changed in 2015 at the EASD in Stockholm because this was the first trial to report not only safety but a benefit. And here you see the effect on the primary outcome of empagliflozin in the EMPA-REG outcome trial, a 14% reduction in MACE, a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure by 35%, a reduction in cardiovascular death by 38%, and a beneficial effect on renal function over the duration of the trial. So Darren McGuire did a nice meta-analysis looking at MACE, and what you can see here is a very uh, uh, positive beneficial effect in the pooled estimate. Uh, most of the trials, except for Virtus, show a shift to the left with respect to MACE. Heart failure hospitalization, even a more robust benefit uh, shown in all the trials. Let's look at MACE with respect to GLP-1 receptor agonists, and you see a benefit um, uh, that is not uh, consistent, but uh, demonstrated with most of the uh, trials. As far as heart failure hospitalization, there is no consistent uh, benefit. So these trials, as well as many others, provided the evidence for the American Diabetes Association and other societies to develop guidelines and here we see that, in fact, the American Diabetes Association in 2021 recommends that for people with risk factors or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure, that one goes along the path of a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And that is for individuals with, uh, uh, with uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or risk factors. However, if heart failure is the primary uh, concern, then an SGLT2 inhibitor is preferred. And for CKD, similarly, the data is stronger for an SGLT2 inhibitor. So what I've tried to do briefly is provide you with 
the evidence that has informed not only clinical practice guidelines, but our day-to-day -day management of patients with type 2 diabetes and has resulted in an improved outcome, uh, particularly as it relates to cardiovascular disease. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for those fantastic presentations, sort of a whirlwind of lots of research and information packed into short, concise presentations. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I certainly invite the audience to uh, ask any questions that may have come up as you were listening and enter that into the, the Q&A. And I'm going to actually start with, uh, with Uncle Bernie. So I, I have a question for you, sir, about the, the realization of all the great stuff we have. And this was alluded to actually even in the first session. But I mean, you clearly show we have tremendous data. Uh, millions and millions of dollars have been spent. More importantly, thousands and thousands of patients have volunteered their time to be part of these trials. But yet our use of these outcome reducing therapies are still sitting at about 22% in that recent analysis looking at, at uh, di multiple different countries. So why, why? Why do you think that is? And, and what can we do to try to try to fix this? Yeah, you know, clinical inertia is a huge problem. And obviously, a uh, symposium like today and uh, continued education is critical. But uh, just to give you another example, when the DCCT results were presented in 1993, that intensive therapy with four injections or a pump was clearly the uh, treatment of choice for type 1 diabetes. It took years until that became adopted uh, universally. And so um, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor agonists are being used with greater uh, uh, frequency, but not enough yet. And so it's very frustrating uh, for us who are, are involved in the research to see the slow translation of uh, critical research findings. Um, so um, we need to just keep plugging away at this, but I think it's uh, classic clinical inertia. People don't like changes. And I think the uh, multidisciplinary learning is going to be critical, right? Because certainly these therapies don't belong to diabetes, uh, certainly not anymore. They've gone beyond beyond those walls for sure. Uh, I, I, I'm going to turn to to my co-chair, uh, Jade. I understand you, you had some questions uh, for uh, Dr. Hegley, for Rob. I, I'm, I'm going to sure. let you fire away with that. And I hope they're tough ones too. Go ahead. Well, it's been a while since I've had a chat with him, so... We can catch up, um, but please, others, feel free to, to um, type in questions for us. Um, but start with, uh, we'll start with the emergence of the PCSK9 antibodies, and now the recent approval of the AGT PTL um, PTL3 um, antibody as well. They're both very effective at lowering LDL, and, and in, in the second case, in lowering um, VLDL as well. But what do you think needs to happen? for these agents to actually get routinely used, um, not only on top of statins, but particularly in statin intolerant patients, which I know there's a lot of controversy around, but the bottom line is, you know, if the patient isn't gonna take the statin, they are gonna take the statin. And, um, and so what are your ideas about how these will actually become more commonly used in these conditions? Yeah, so, uh, so thanks, Jay, and it's, it's nice to see you again. Um, so I think the big thing is is accessibility. Like he did just even off the top. So I mean, if Kiso was approved, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the NGPTL3 uh, monoclonal, but it, but the, the cost I, I've heard is just enormous. Now it's for a very very limited indication, homozygous FH, and it's great. It is it, it is a life changing treatment for those patients. But it is. But right now, you know, it's the cost. And then the same thing when the when the the PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies came out. I mean, I've got 250 patients on them. They're you know mainly heterozygous FH. They they are life changing treatments. Patients love them. Actually, I thought there would be a big issue with. Um, uh, you know, with getting, uh, getting, getting, getting people to wrap their minds around it, but in fact, you know, it's it's, it's been very, very well accepted, it's, and and you know, no no issues with tolerability, but 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 you know, the, the main thing actually is just a practical point of uh, of uh, of access and uh, and coverage. Uh, so, uh, and then, you know, experience and then, you know, getting, getting, uh, 
our colleagues um, more more experience with prescribing them. So I think it it boils down to maybe more uh, practical issues of of, um, uh, of implementation. So while I have you, I'll just ask another implementation question, and that's the LP little a therapy. That looks very impressive as well, very right. potent. Um, but how will that be used? Do you think there's going to be an absolute target? Or as you pointed out, many of the high-risk people that you see have astronomical levels of LP little a, where a 50% reduction, albeit good, still keeps them astronomically high. Yeah. Uh, um, and so how do you anticipate this will ultimately be used? Yeah, so so I think, I think, the, I think it, I mean, the clinical trial is being, I mean, there are actually a couple now that are ongoing to actually there's two, two agents, Amgen and, uh, and Novartis. And so, um, so I, uh, it looks, the, the, the entry criteria are based on high levels. So I think it's going to be a matter of like the higher you are, the, the bigger the benefit. And so then that's going to be necessarily a smaller proportion of the population. And so, you know, LP little a has this very uh, skewed uh, distribution in the population. Most of us are sort of, you know, fortunately have a low level. So, you know, we, we wouldn't need that uh, that drug. There would be other forms of residual risk to try to target. So, so I think, um, I, so I, I actually believe that those, those studies are, are going to be positive, but uh, then I think necessarily it's going to be a, a restricted market uh, for or who's going to who's going to use them? Now, I I have a question uh, for Jay actually, and uh, as a gastroenterologist, you're now facing an audience full of endocrinologists and cardiologists and nephrologists, and and have an opportunity to give us messages around fatty liver because we certainly all of us are seeing patients with fatty liver and probably missing. Most of them are not recognizing it or not doing the right things about it. So what what do you want to tell us uh, so that we, we can start doing things uh, better? Well, so that actually brings me to Dr. Zinman because I was hoping to see NAFL on his slide. He had a very nice slide of uh, additional desirable characteristics yeah. of anti-hyperglycemic medications. And, I think NAPL should be on there as well, and certainly Absolutely. a couple of them that you discussed um, show, or, or, you know, I, I, in my personal opinion, is one of them is likely to be the first one that actually is approved for the treatment of fatty liver disease. But your, um, but that's personal uh, opinion, not based on any real data yet. Um, but nevertheless, you're right. I mean, the 80, what 80 plus percent of the patients you see in your diabetes clinic is going to have a fatty liver, and uh, the question that we all struggle with is who to treat, when, and how. Uh, currently, as most know, the entry criteria for the fatty liver trials are very strict and uh, require a certain type of disease, which uh, the majority of people don't have, fortunately. Um, but it is very restrictive, and and then showing improvement becomes even e even more difficult. But um, I think that uh, there are a number of drugs under study. Um, many of them are to to reduce lipogenesis, as I discussed in my talk. But, um, you know, I have the same question with fatty liver as I did with Rob with LP little a, whereas, you know, a 50% reduction in these trials is very good. But if you're starting at 60% liver fat, is getting to 30% liver fat, does that really matter? Uh, and we don't know the answer to that question. And does the absolute liver fat matter? You have inflammation and, of course, the cirrhosis is what most people are interested in. But I'd also be interested in Dr. Zinman's ideas since I personally think that, you um, the most likely course of a, of, a, of a successful drug is going to come through um, some of the drugs that he discussed. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that uh, there are two ways of approaching the fatty liver issue, the NAFL and, and, and NASH, is, is in the context of the new therapies for diabetes have robust effects on weight, uh, particularly if you look at the GLP-1, GIP, dual agonist, terzepatide, as an example. Uh, you're talking about 12 uh, uh, kilogram weight loss, uh, more than 10, in some patients, more than 10%. I think that's going to have a huge impact on, on the uh, hepatic biology. In addition, as you point out, there may be some uh, diabetes therapies that have a direct effect on hepatic uh, fat. And uh, you're absolutely right. We're going to have to modify that slide as that's another added value that we should be looking for. So not only do we have diabetes therapies that fall in their nephrologists, cardiologists, now of course it will be hepatologists as well.
so the question from the audience here, and I'm going to direct this to Rob, uh, asking about lowering LDL levels to below 0 0.5 and keeping it there for a, a longer period of time. Do we have data about safety for doing that? Yeah. So, I mean, we're starting to get data. So I, th I think, you know, like the, the, ex the extreme would be the, the person who has zero LDL. Okay. So we know that that's, that's not good, you know, A beta lipoproteinemia, but you know, some LDL, like 0 0.3, 0 0.5, I mean, that's, you know, we, we that's, you know, you know, even in infancy, that's quite a common level and, you know, infants are, are developing okay. So, so, and now, and now with, uh, with PCSK9 inhibitors, we routinely, I mean, I'm routinely seeing patients with levels that low and I'm, I'm just letting them go. You know, I, there, I, you know, the, from the, the subgroups from the clinical trial show that it's safe, you know, neurocognitive assessments say, show that it's, safe so i mean over the short term over the like the the window of where you're trying to prevent an mi say a three to five year period now we don't know over 20 or 30 years but 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 you know we're uh, so i think the, the more experience we gain the, the 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 safer we feel about it and it's it's a uh, so the, the the whole the whole uh, distribution is is shifting okay Maybe I'll. Do we have time for maybe one, a couple from the uh, audience? And uh, one of the first ones that appeared um, was a very basic question: Why use metformin first? Yeah. Um, it doesn't have the added value uh, from your list. Uh, and yes, it's safe and cheap, but not effective. Uh, not effective in reducing some of the secondary things you discussed. So, uh, Dr. Zinman. There actually is a movement to, to uh, move away from metformin, and the European Cardiology Society uh, actually recommends that it not be the first. Uh, and um, our uh, co-chair, uh, Alice, will be debating uh, metformin uh, in the next uh, section of this uh, presentation, so whether it should be used or not. Uh, uh, I, it's hard to displace uh, mother metformin. <laughs> we all love it because it's safe and it uh, results in weight loss, no hypoglycemia, it's effective. So wait to hear that debate. So I guess there's yeah, one there's... more, um, I, I'm not quite sure I understand, relevance to perirenal fat, which exacerbates primary hypertension. Um, I'll let Alice or Dr. Zinman maybe try to address that. I'm going to let Alice address it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to let Uncle Bernie address that one. <laughs> so no, I, I, I yeah, don't so, know that I can yeah, comment I think, on that one. Well, you know, actually, people have looked at fat. You know, we always think of fat in the liver and uh, in the viscera, but there, people have looked at pericardial fat, and there may, uh, you know, uh, that the kind of fat uh, that is either in the organ or around the organ is certainly not the kind of fat you want. And, uh, you know, the subcutaneous fat seems to be um, uh, innocuous, I guess, is uh, a term we could use, but it's the, you know, they're, they're different kinds of fat and uh, it's very metabolically active. So I want to take this opportunity to thank, uh, thank all three of you for a fantastic presentation and, and thanks the audience for their questions for an engaging panel discussion. And of course, thank, uh, thank the sponsor, thank Pfizer for the opportunity to uh, be part of this symposium. And I uh, encourage everyone to stay tuned for the next section of the At The Limits conference. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this debate, which is more of a discussion rather than a debate. You've just heard in the last session the two closing statements, which was there was a movement away from using metformin as a first line, and somebody else called metformin, the mother of metformin, who we all love. So mother metformin. We have two formidable speakers for the motion is Professor Cliff Bailey, who himself does not need an introduction. He's a professor of clinical science at the University of Aston in Birmingham, uh, is winner of many prizes, editor of many journals, uh, and he will speak for the motion. And Alice Cheng will later be introduced and will speak against the motion. So welcome everyone, please be ready to have as many questions as you can once both speakers have given us their views. Thank you very much, Cliff, and welcome. Uh, Stephanie, thank you very much indeed for that lovely introduction. Metformin should be first-line therapy. Well, I'm here to defend metformin as first-line therapy. 
I have no conflicts as far as I'm aware. And I'd like to approach this firstly by asking, is metformin ideal? What are its attributes? And then to compare it with the alternatives. Um, so metformin stands at the top of most algorithms for type 2 diabetes as our first choice agent added to lifestyle. And this here is really a, a simplified version of the ADA-EASD algorithm to illustrate the point. So uh, let's answer the question, why is metformin universally tops? Well, I'd like to look at 10 ideal properties for first-line therapy. It's got to be an agent that's uh, got good glucose lowering efficacy, not cause hypos, uh, not cause weight gain, got a good safety profile, hopefully reduce cardiovascular risk. The cap of, uh, compatibility with other glucose lowering agents that it might be used with extra benefits, inexpensive, plenty of experience and increased survival. And if we had an agent that would tick all those boxes, it would get 10 out of 10. And well, metformin does just that. So let's have a look at the evidence for that. Um, metformin, as we can see, is a small bi biguanide molecule. It's uh, easily produced. It's got well-established pharmacokinetics. And there are scores of studies that are testament to its efficacy as first-line therapy with durable glucose lowering. And we can see this in the meta-analysis on the right side of this slide. Uh, also, of course, we know that it works without causing hypos, without weight gain, without raising basal insulin levels. So we might ask, how does it do this? Well, essentially, it counters insulin resistance with a variety of insulin-dependent and independent effects that uh, on the left-hand side of the slide here, increase glucose turnover in the splank bed. And in the middle, we can see reducing hepatic glucose output. And on the right-hand side, we can see increasing peripheral glucose uptake. And despite some equivocal comments, we do know the multiple cellular actions of metformin, they vary between tissues and at different uh, levels of drug exposure. And we know that they are individually modest, but collectively, they're very considerable. We don't have time to go through them all now, but at least we have the pathways. So uh, now, we have to turn to the, the latest things that are happening. And although metformin doesn't have recent dedicated cardiovascular outcome trials, there are lots of studies that show clear cardiovascular benefits. Here are 21 studies with over 700,000 patients showing reduced cardiovascular events. But I'd like us to remember that the cardiovascular effects of metformin tend to be slowly generated. And so if we look, for example, at the UK PDS data, we can see quite clearly that it takes a long time to actually capture the full cardiovascular benefit and that short-term studies really aren't going to be very informative. We can see the benefit here of metformin in the blue line at the bottom of each of those graphs. And Yes, metformin does reduce the risk of heart failure, both the onset and the severity. And we see here the reduced mortality risk. But although metformin is protective against heart failure and atherosclerotic events, it is, of course, contraindicated when the conditions are severe enough to cause significant hypoxia. So we have to remember that one. Now, metformin is recognized for its beneficial extras, such as, for example, the reduced occurrence of several types of cancers. So you can see here metformin in the blue line, and you can see that uh, 
it's able to reduce the risk of both pancreatic and colorectal cancers. Metformin also reduces the procoagulant state of type 2 diabetes. So on the left-hand side, we can see that it reduces platelet aggregation. See the green line coming down for metformin. And below that, we can see that it lowers I1 levels. And on the right-hand side, on the far right panel, we can see that it actually thins the fibrin clots, making um, their breakdown much more convenient. It's also safe as a drug to continue in pregnancy, and it may actually reduce inflammation, which I believe uh, John Deanfield mentioned, you can't give a lecture these days without mentioning it, COVID, uh, that this meta-analysis clearly shows that each of the studies that have looked, we can see that pre-admission use of metformin actually reduces the mortality risk from COVID-19 in people with diabetes. And contrary to some historical misinterpretations, metformin actually does reduce the deterioration in glomerular filtration, as we can see here in the left-hand panel by the end-stage free survival. And we know that the main safety issue of metformin, right-hand side is lactic acidosis, but it's rare, it's barely distinguishable from background and we know how to minimize risk, get the EGFR and reduce the dose. Uh, if we were to compare metformin with the possible alternatives listed across the top here, sulfonylurea DPD-4 inhibitor, GLP-1, uh, SGLT-2 uh, inhibitor and GLP-1 receptor agonist, then we can see that by the time we get down to the bottom of this list, it's really only metformin that keeps the score of 10 out of 10. And lastly, and importantly, the CVOTs uh, that have been tested with the newer agents, and I've listed here the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors, they're mostly, as you can see in the metformin column, as add-on to metformin. They're not monotherapy in drug naive patients. So, in conclusion, metformin has proven attributes for metabolic efficacy, for cardiorenal protection and safety. It's got extra benefits. It's got decades of experience, and it addresses the underlying pathology. And of course, it's not expensive. So, I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff, for that. Uh, that's very, very interesting. Uh, I think Teresa, my co-chair, will introduce the next speaker who will speak against the motion. Thank you very much and good evening from London from a mere cardiologist. So that I understood that. So and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, Professor Alice Cheng, who's a local from uh, Director of the Endocrinology and Metabolism at um, C Credit Valley in Mississauga and St. Michael's Toronto. So you've got to speak against the motion. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, Madam Chairpersons, Professor Bailey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is certainly my pleasure to be part of this conference and to be arguing the side which I think is uh, pretty straightforward. And, and I kind of feel bad, I have to admit, because it is, I think, about two o'clock in the morning, if I'm not mistaken, for Professor Bailey right now. So I think we'll, we'll need to forgive uh, the comments that he, he made earlier with respect to the use of metformin uh, from the get-go. Because I think if you were to ask me, should metformin be first-line therapy in type 2 diabetes, I would certainly say no. Now, in terms of disclosures, I, I have certainly worked with a variety of companies that do in fact make therapies that I will be speaking about tonight. But I think the most important disclosure that I have to give right now is the fact that I, I am a card carrying endocrinologist. I, I have the diploma, I, I got my rural college, I passed the exam and therefore I love metformin. I love metformin, I love insulin. I will never stop loving metformin. I will never stop loving insulin. However, having said that, I think once you realize that you deserve better, letting go will be the best decision ever. So what does 
deserving better mean? And I think we all know that the real reason why we all get up in the morning and, and go to work and, and do our best with our patients is to ultimately do this. Our end goal is to help reduce outcomes. And that is in fact the priority when managing type two diabetes. And we are talking about microvascular outcomes, macrovascular outcomes, and of course, mortality. Now, Professor Bailey has shown us some data around metformin and the reduction in some of these outcomes, but you'll notice that they come from meta-analyses of multiple studies. And when you look at the studies themselves, many of them do in fact cross one. And uh, as he's pointed out, we really do not have a large uh, modern day randomized control trial to really prove the outcome reducing properties of, of metformin but contrast that with the other therapies we do have, such as the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Here's a meta-analysis of the cardiovascular outcome trials and not, not just one, not just two, not just three, but multiple studies with different GLP-1 receptor agonists across the spectrum of patient types have in fact demonstrated reductions in MACE as shown on the top, major adverse cardiovascular events, as well as reduction in cardiovascular death as shown on the bottom. Now, some may say, okay, well, there's a spectrum of patients here, but what about the early patient? Well, of course, we have data from the Rewind study that's shown here with dulaglutide, where 70% of the patients in that study were, in fact, high-risk primary prevention individuals living with type 2 diabetes. But what about the outcome of stroke? Now, stroke is arguably the most feared outcome amongst our patients. And here we even have very encouraging data from the GLP-1 cardiovascular trials demonstrating reductions in non-fatal stroke as well as total stroke. But it's not just the GLP-1 receptor agonists. We also have the SGLT2 inhibitors. And here is another meta-analysis. So again, not one, not two, not three, but multiple studies demonstrating reductions, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and of course, hospitalization for heart failure, as well as the composite kidney outcomes. And again, here, one may argue, okay, well, these patients are further along in their type 2 diabetes journey. But remember, in the context of the DECLARE study, there was a high percentage of patients who were also high-risk primary prevention individuals. And arguably, many of the people who we diagnose type 2 diabetes with already have multiple risk factors. Now, the other important point, and this was already made by Professor Bailey, is the fact that within these cardiovascular outcome trials, there was a background of metformin therapy. However, the organ-protecting, life-saving benefits that I've just shown you were actually demonstrated with, or importantly, without metformin. So here we have an analysis of the SGLT2 studies, looking specifically at MACE, showing that the benefits were independent of the use of metformin. You can see the p-value for heterogeneity there of 0.14. The same is true for hospitalization for heart failure. Metformin presence did not seem to impact whether or not you saw this benefit. And then here are the kidney outcomes. Again, the presence or absence of metformin did not impact the benefit that was seen. So therefore, the argument that we should have metformin in place first because of the way the trials were designed, I think may actually create a barrier to getting people on the drugs that have been proven to reduce outcomes. Now, a third very important point, and again, this was mentioned by Professor Bailey, was the time required for the metformin benefits, if they are in fact there, for the metformin benefits to manifest. Contrast that with the GLP-1 and SGLT-2 studies where the outcome benefits were seen in a very short period of time. Here we have a whole slew of these studies and the median follow-up range from 18.2 months to 5.4 years. So it did not require decades of therapy in order to be able to show reductions in outcomes. And then finally, even if you were to look at the group where we do not have the firmest evidence. So the, those with ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, those with chronic kidney disease, those with heart failure, particularly HEF-REF, and those with multiple risk factors, I think we have firm data now. But for that small subset of patients you still have who have type 2 diabetes that do not fall into those categories, well, I would prefer 
preferentially select a therapy that is going to address multiple risk factors. And here we have the familiar ABCDESs from Diabetes Canada from our guidelines. And if we just think about SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists, we can actually address the A, the B, the D, and the E in terms of how these medications work. Whereas metformin, although as I said, I love metformin, addresses the A for sure, and th that would be about it. So therefore, I think if we're thinking about what benefits, additional benefits, other therapies may bring, I think there would be advantages over that of metformin. So again, reducing outcomes is the priority. The organ protecting life-saving benefits are there with or without metformin. GLP-1's SGLT2 inhibitors have provided outcome reduction in under five years, and I would preferentially use therapies that address multiple risk factors. So it is in fact time to move on. In the words of Elsa from Frozen, it is time to let it go. And if we think about 1998, when UKPDS came out, this was the computers that we used in 1998. This is sort of metformin, but now we're sitting in 2021 and we've got far fancier, better tools to use. And I think the 1990s are calling and asking for their metformin back. So with that, I would argue that metformin should not be first line therapy in type two diabetes. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you very much, Alice. I think we have uh, some time for questions to start off with before you have a chance to give a final view each on uh, what's going on. Uh, that will be very, very interesting. We've got the very first question coming in, uh, which says, how effective is metformin in primary prevention of type 2 diabetes, especially in pre-diabetes? I don't know who would like to take that. I can uh, comfortably take that. That's a big one for me because metformin actually has an indication for prediabetes. So it can be used to prevent diabetes. It has a mass of information which shows that it is a primary preventer of cardiovascular disease. And if we look at all the trials that are called CBOPs, you will see that the vast majority of those patients, and in some cases, 100% of those patients, actually were already having cardiovascular events. So those trials were secondary prevention. So they don't count. It's metformin's primary prevention that counts. Come on then, Alice, take that one on. <laughs> I, I, I feel like we should go with the questions first, and then I'll uh, take you on. <laughs> uh, Alice, is there anything else you wanted to add to that, or? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm happy no. to go with the no. next question. Thank right. you. Can I just check what you were telling me as a mere cardiologist? Is it? Uh, I would read what you were saying is actually it's got nothing to do with blood glucose. It's got to do with what these other drugs do to cardiovascular risk, whereas metformin is lowering blood glucose, and I got that message loud and clear. Uh, so you uh, you sort of got that message loud and clear, and I have to be very careful or else I may get kicked out of the endocrinology club. I, I, I think what, what we are saying is that the SGLT2 inhibitor GLP-1 benefits are independent of their glucose lowering properties. And uh, these drugs certainly cross borders and do not belong to one, one specialty or one uh, diabetes uh, or one chronic disease per se, but uh, belong to the patients because I think the benefits are truly tremendous. I, I, there's another question coming. I'm not sure if I 100% understand it, but I will read it out. I think it's just uh, typed fast. Uh, so it says in diabetes, we need to lower the level of glycemia and we may get additional ammunition of ALB addition and diminution of HbA1c if and if uh, if we use a different mechanism to help the patient so that's more than a statement i suppose do we agree that it is helpful to have different drugs with different mechanisms uh, i can take that one on and say that i think we'll all agree that it's not just glucose that we need to deal with it's all the other factors and that's why we both added them into our arguments. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think like with anything else, like with hypertension, 
uh, we want to deal with the issue from multiple pathways. So it does make a lot of sense to use combination therapies in order to address uh, any of these parameters. And there's another question which says, please, could you convince us of the harmful effects of metformin? Uh, no, I can't. Um, that's, that's, that would be almost impossible. Um, uh, when metformin was looked at by the FDA, they realized that it's going to be somewhere in the region of one case per 30,000 patients treated per year. And therefore, no one could afford to do a study big enough to actually piece this together. So uh, safety is certainly a wonderful thing for metformin. And I cannot disagree with that, unfortunately. <laughs> so I'm going to come to you, Alice, because you were saying there may be better things than metformin. And I liked your old computer, new computer, had forgotten what that computer looked like in 1998. Uh, so they're saying the newer drugs have backup of companies to do more expensive studies. So they have, uh, and they are metformin for the other drugs because most of the world will be end up using metformin uh, because of finances. Uh, so you, you cut out there momentarily for my feed there, but I, I think the question was that uh, the other drugs have big studies behind them and big support, whereas metformin, uh, have been, having been around longer, does not quite have that. And, yep. and I, I agree in terms of the, the randomized control and the, the, the type of studies that have been done recently, obviously with the newer agents. The issue with metformin is that the studies that have been done, A, were done in a previous era where we did not necessarily have as much statin or, or um, RAS blockade or all those other therapies that we know are very effective. So it's very difficult to answer that question. And, and I'm going to come out of character here because it's getting hard because I do love metformin. In my mind, it's very much about combination therapy. It's actually not let's just use metformin first and then wait five years and then add something else. To me, it's let's just add outcome reducing therapy and metformin at the same time. They, they should be holding hands. They should not be fighting each other. That's very much how I would see it. And I would hate to see metformin be a barrier to the initiation of outcome reducing therapy. And, and I think um, th that would be how I would envision the future should more look like. So I think, I think we are nearly coming to the time when we would like you both to give some final words. Unfortunately, we can't have a vote. I think there's about 500 people listening to this talk uh, in Canada and there's about a handful in London, as you know. Uh, well past midnight, but so if you could just give us your thoughts and persuade us why or why not metformin should be the first line agent in type 2 diabetes. Alice, do you want to go first? Sure. So I, I feel like we need to move beyond our, our love affair with metformin, not to, not to dump it completely, but then to actually think about it not being the sole first line therapy, because many of our patients at diagnosis already have multiple risk factors and could benefit from additional uh, therapies that will reduce outcomes in the long term. So yes, glucose control will always be important. It is complementary, not competitive. And I think we need to remember that, complementary, not competitive. So in my opinion, it should actually be an outcome reducing therapy plus metformin from the beginning. So in some ways I am conceding to uh, Professor Bailey in that metformin could be part of that equation for first-line therapy. Oh, that was very nice. Thank you very much. But I'm still determined uh, to just mention that we are dealing here with first-line glucose-lowering approach. The evidence lies with metformin because there is so much evidence. And for the new agents, they have proven their worth, certainly, but not yet as first line agents because we don't actually have that evidence so if we're going to be evidence based at the moment it's still metformin back to you thank you is that theresa anything you wanted to add as a cardiologist uh, as a cardiologist and as a heart failure cardiologist I, i'm getting the gist of it here i think metformin 
is probably analogous to us using a loop diuretic. A patient with heart failure needs a diuretic to take away their symptoms and signs of congestion, but we'd never leave them without an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker and an MRA. So I think we're going in the same direction there. Lovely. So do you think we have to add everything together and hold hands? <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think that is a, I think food for thought. It's very, very interesting because I like Alice, I'm an endocrinologist and I love metformin. So, but I think also we need to obviously think of not waiting uh, unnecessary. So not do harm by not doing anything. Yeah. If you say first do no harm, we should also not do harm by waiting. Yeah. I would like to thank you both for both speakers for a wonderful session. Very, very interesting. Uh, and for the organizers of this symposium to uh, for, for inviting us all. And I wish you a good evening from London. Good evening. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye. all. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Carl. That was good. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the end of day one, and I'm sure you'll agree with me and Dan that our esteemed colleagues from across the globe have brought us some really thought-provoking, eye-opening and indeed entertaining presentations. And it's also been a pleasure to have your input throughout the evening via the chat function. Um, we're back tomorrow at the same time, that is, I think, 6 p.m. Eastern, with the second evening of cardiology, diabetes and nephrology at the limits. Many thanks for joining us and we look forward for your, to your company tomorrow. Dan, would you like to say a few words in closing? Yeah, just uh, terrific lectures and special uh, shout out to our technical staff in London as we approach the morning. Uh, we really appreciate your effort, folks. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's time for bed here. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.